Well, hey, everybody, this is Scott Schimmel, and I am here with the Dream Big Podcast with Bob Goff. Hey, everybody, I hope you guys are having a great day. And today we have a great guest on. It's not an interview because we don't do interviews. We do conversations with friends. We've got Joshua Dubois, and we're going to talk about him in a second. But the question as we get into this episode, Bob, have you ever had a moment where all of a sudden, because of that moment you went through, something grabbed you, and all of a sudden you realized there's a dream inside you that you didn't know you had before? It was about a decade ago, and uh, I was in India. We were had gone down to find these bonded laborers, people that were working against their will. And we were up on a rooftop. It was midnight, and we were like fingerprinting these people. And I realized, oh my goodness, you can actually free people. Hmm. Like it, it isn't somebody else that yeah. does that. Like normal people hmm. can do that. And the crazy part is I realized that across the street from me too, a little bit later, that you could actually be available to people. And I know it sounds like hmm. so self-evident, but I feel like I bookend that. I saw that you could go far away and make a difference and you can go across the street and make a difference. Well, that's interesting because there's people that when they were born, they had this dream to be a doctor or to be a teacher. And others of us didn't have that. There wasn't something just innate deep down within us. And we have to go through life in order to find our big ambitions. Yeah, isn't that true? And some of the opportunities that come your way, if you're looking for them, yeah. then all of a sudden you go like, oh my gosh, I didn't, I'm connecting the dots right now. Yeah. This is something, it's been like a riffing on a, on an idea that, mm -hmm. that has been planted inside me for years and years. And I just love that we get to talk to friends like uh, Joshua today yeah. about that. And, and that's the thing about uh, this podcast. All we're doing is talking to our friends. Yeah. I'm not going to yeah. talk to people that invented yeah. things that I've never uh, encountered. I just want to bring in uh, the same room uh, friends that I have and friends that, uh, that are listening and to say, what could we learn from each other? So tell us about Joshua. How did you guys become friends? I met Joshua years ago. It was at the time that uh, he was the director of faith base and neighborhood partnerships for the Obama administration. This crazy young guy who was making all these immense uh, impacts throughout the country at a, a really beautiful time in our country. He was a guy who was super busy, but the only thing that outmatched his busyness was his availability. Mm -hmm. You could sit in a room with him and 500 other people, you'd feel like you're the only person mm -hmm. sitting in that room. You know how that it makes you feel? And he was a guy that I thought, you know what? I want to be mm -hmm. friends with him. And so in the years that have come and gone since then, uh, we've been on adventures together here and abroad, and and I've also like was sat at his wedding and watched him marry the girl of his dreams. And uh, one of the things about Joshua, he's a really authentic guy, and he's a guy that sees these moments that happen in his life as really moving. He mm. captures them. He doesn't let them pass by. And what I love about what you'll be able to do in this next little bit is eavesdrop on a conversation with a friend uh, about times that have moved him important moments that made him change. And here's the hope. We each have these beautiful moments that happen in our life. We can either grab them or we can let them slip by unnoticed. And my hope is that by listening into conversations amongst friends that you could grab a couple of yours. You get clarity about an ambition of yours and you say, what's my next step? I can't wait. Let's get into it. So Joshua, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast. Yeah. It's good seeing you. I'm looking at you on the video screen right here. You're looking good. And one of the things that we do at this podcast is just uh, have conversations among friends uh, yeah. where we've done some life together and we talk about some of the ambitions that people have had. And you've had so many uh, things that you've been involved in. And I'd love if you could just give us a little overview of some of the ambitions that you had and how some of those came true. And uh, tell, tell us from, say, in college days, what was your ambition? How did you go after that? Sure. Well, um, I went to, uh, to college at Boston University, and in my freshman and sophomore years, my ambitions were to find a girlfriend and to somehow become cool, which I was not when I was in high school. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> did I didn't have that? much ambition at all at, at BU, but I believe it or not. Um, but something interesting happened. Um, um, 
And one day I heard about the case of a young African immigrant named Amadou Diallo, who was um, killed by police. He was shot 41 times um, uh, because he pulled out his wallet and they thought it was a gun. And it just broke my heart um, and it kind of shook me up. And um, I decided, um, I don't know why um, still to this, to this day, I didn't, I didn't really think it through, um, but I decided to put his name on a poster board and stand in the middle of my campus and have people come by um, and ask me about him um, because I, I wanted his his name to mean something in the world and, and it was it broke my heart that that he was lost and that his mother would never see him again and um, and for some reason God just used that moment to kind of shake me up and, and wake me up um, and so that was like the start of me having awareness about the world around me because before that time again I was pretty um, just focused on myself um, so wrapped up at BU went to uh, to grad school um, I had been a, um, a after that time, long story short, when I was out there doing that protest, somebody invited me to church. Um, I gave my life to Christ at a local church because of the guy who I met during that protest. And, um, and I was, became an associate pastor at that church as well. And I was trying to figure out if I was going to keep being a pastor or move into politics and policy. I went to graduate school, um, and studied politics and public affairs, um, and decided I wanted to work for a guy named, um, at that time, State Senator Barack Obama. Um, I had heard a speech that he gave at the 2004 Democratic National Convention, um, and it resonated with me, um, and I decided I wanted to work for him, but I didn't know anybody in politics. So I guess I'll pause there, but that's, that, that was the earliest awakening of my ambition. Well, we've got to talk about that because uh, many people have heard of him. <laughs> but you uh, uh, moved from just hearing about somebody to saying, I have an ambition, I want to work with him. And so sometimes uh, ambitions and opportunities find themselves together, and sometimes people make the opportunity happen. Uh, so yeah. you're in graduate school, faith is important to you, you meet somebody who dazzles you, you say, this is the thing. What happens next? Yeah, it was kind of interesting, man. So I was um, in between my first and second years in grad school. Um, I was working, um, I went to grad school in New Jersey, but I was working in DC for the summer, as often happens, I was doing an internship on Capitol Hill. Um, and I was at a, um, when I tell the story to my grandma, I say restaurant, but actually it was a bar uh, <laughs> where, I was wa where I was watching the 2004 DNC. Um, and this guy with these big old ears and this really weird name was giving this awesome speech in Boston. And it was state Senator Barack Obama who was running for the United States Senate. Um, and he's talked about all the policies that I cared about and um, health care and poverty and so forth. But then out of nowhere, he started talking about the awesome God that we serve in the blue states. And, you know, I immediately thought about, um, you know, growing up in the church and going to Fellowship of Christian Athletes camps and singing our God is an awesome God. And I was like, man, this is a guy who, you know, I, I like what he's talking about. So um, went back to school wrote him a few letters to his Senate campaigns, got form letter rejections <laughs> from uh, my outreach. In fact, I have um, in my office now a copy of one of the rejection letters. And I decided to just drive down from New Jersey to DC to show up at his office, um, at his transition office, and see if I could get an interview. Let me stop you there for a second, because a lot of times I'll talk to people who have tremendous faith, and they uh, have had an ambition, they've wanted to go after it, and somebody sends them a form letter and says no, and they say this nonsense that God just closed the door. I'm like, buddy, you just got a no from Billy. That's the only thing that happened there. Why was it that you weren't taken off the scent? Because you got to know, you didn't say God shut the door. You said, no, 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 I still want it. I might even want it more right now. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things. One was some good advice, you know, in the same way that you give people some awesome advice when it comes to overcoming uh, their fears. Um, I got some good advice from a, a professor, a mentor of mine at, um, in grad school who it wasn't anything too profound. It was just that people are really, really busy. And if you really want something, um, you have to allow for their busyness, but to continue to present yourself over and over again um, until you get a clear answer one way or the other. And so he basically said that, listen, don't, it's expected that you're going to get a lot of no's until you get their first yes. Um, but then, you know, I also just started thinking like, you know, I know that there are people who have like inside connections and they're like backroom deals. And I heard about this thing called networking, which I didn't know how to do. I'm like, but they're just people. They're just people in Barack Obama's office in DC. And I know that I have something to offer them. And there's got to be a way 
to break through all the you know, networking and inside connections and so forth and just present myself for who I am to these people. Um, and so I did. I went down. Um, I showed up at his office. Um, the first time, unfortunately, they said no one was available to meet with me. So I literally drove back up 95, four hours back to Jersey. Second time, two weeks later, I drove back down again. Um, and they told me that, you know, because of my persistence, I could meet with somebody and I had a wonderful conversation with this guy. I thought it was really great. I, he was, um, re- I thought he was really into me. Um, they said they'd give me a call. And I started driving back to Jersey. And I Googled them. It ended up being the IT guy. They had me sit down with it. So, <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, there was something, though. I got back up to Jersey. And, I, and I, I was like, this can't be the end of the road. And I prayed. And I sent a message to his legislative director, the guy named Chris Liu, and said, listen, I've been down there twice. Um, you know, I really feel like I have something to offer you guys. Would you give me a shot? And Chris wrote me back. And I still have his email to this day and said, I don't know why you keep bugging us, basically. But um, if you want a, a low-level, entry-level job, I'd be happy to talk with you. You're way overqualified for it, but, um, but we can talk about it. And so that led to an informational interview, which led to a real interview. And that led to a, to a job in the senator's office. Oh, man. And I want people to hear this, that idea of uh, persistence and tenacity, and you don't do it, but you can have all the attitude you want. It just needs to be the attitude of Christ. Like just being humble, but being persistent and resolute. I love that. I just, you're not taking these things as little uh, signals because you got to know, or you have to drive or don't make a list, make a call. Uh, don't say I'm going to get around. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like it's, I don't know, there's something in your gut that tells you when it's a God no or when it's your own hangups that are saying no, right? When it's your own sense of being aggrieved or offended or just frustrated. Like you kind of, that feels one way. And then when God says no, no, that feels another way. Then it's just time to move on, right? But I wasn't getting a God no. I was getting a lot of my own no's, like feeling frustrated or feeling um, just uh, you know, just like I, I wished I got a different answer, but, but I wasn't feeling like God was closing the door. And so I knew that we're still an opportunity. Yes. I think you and I would both be single guys if we that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. turned away. And I got all we kinds were... of no's, man, uh, from Michelle I, Dubois until I boy. finally got that. Yes. So, yeah. And there's something, dude, you only need one. Yes. Whether yeah, it's from the one. guy with the worst Rocco. move she ever made, but I, I'm glad I got the yes. Though. Yeah. <laughs> tap, tap, no races. Uh, as soon as Maria, I think she just nodded her head. I don't yeah. think I got a full yes out of her. That's exactly yeah. right. Man. <laughs> one of the things that uh, happens, though, you find one opportunity, and they usually don't find their way your way. Uh, what you do is you cause some things to happen. You've got something stern in your gut. Yep. You feel like it's something like presence of God, his wind at your back, and you try something. And I love that you just didn't get off the scent when you got a no. You got to keep going. And even after like, you know, even after I got the job, like it was still, a, I wasn't his faith guy at the outset. I was, you know, a legislative correspondent, which meant I wrote uh, mail to constituents from Illinois that were writing in. Um, and I had, I, I feel like the, one of the, the important things here, and I, can I, I know this through trial and error, not because I'm, I have anything figured out, but is you take advantage of the opportunities that God presents. And then in the middle of those opportunities, you work really, really hard. Like I had to knock it out of the park for two years writing mail. Um, And then one day, um, then Senator Obama said he wanted to give a speech about his faith. And he asked, is there anyone in the office who, you know, thinks a lot about faith? (laughs) And and I could raise my hand and say, I could help you with this, this speech and then moved on once he decided to run for president. Um, It's sort of the same thing where he was like, Hey, who, um, you know, we need to reach out to the faith community. And so, but, but in between, it's a ton of hard work. You can't just kind of be waiting around for that opportunity. You just got to grind it out until God presents the, you know, opens the window and then it's time to go. Sometimes the head fake is that you'll see somebody that you're not well acquainted with and you haven't seen all the hustle that's behind that. And they, you think that it just happened magically, like somebody sprinkled pixie dust over them. And then it all just happens. But really, when you uh, blow the foam off the top in most of our lives, it's just, you know, if you work tirelessly for enough years uh, towards this beautiful ambition, the thing is that you found an ambition that was really worthwhile. Uh, You had, uh, I think sometimes people think God 
gives us uh, addresses to head towards instead of just directions to move towards. And, um, and so you had this direction that you kept moving towards. How did you make the transition then to becoming the head of faith-based and neighborhood partnerships? Yeah, again, it was sort of um, focusing on what was ever was in front of me at the time. But then when the possibility for more opened up, having the boldness to jump out then. So it's a, it's a balance. You want to work really, really hard. And so I did in the Senate office. And then there was an opportunity, actually, even going on the campaign in 2008, um, that was something I pitched to to Senator Obama and to his chief of staff. They weren't necessarily looking for a faith outreach director. Now that I think about it, like it was more me saying, I got to take a deep breath and put myself out there. And I put a memo together about why I think this was an important role. And um, and I I wasn't you're not supposed to send emails to a sen- to the senator as a low level staffer, but I did. Um, and he he responded well to it. Same thing. When we were wrapping up the campaign um, when, when he won. You know, I had to was working really hard, um, but I had to put myself out there and say, no, I, I, I want to leave this office for you, the Office of Faith Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. And, um, you know, I'm th- thankful that he gave me the opportunity um, to do so. So, yeah, I, th- I think you're right. Bob. It, was, it wasn't like a specific direction in mind. It was it's just like intense hard work. And then you see you, it's almost like a light shines on a particular opportunity and you know that's the one God has for you. So you jump out there and you don't take no for an answer. Yeah. And you need to uh, let everybody know what your ambition is. Like I, you know, up and I became a grandpa last week and I've been waiting. Congratulations, to be a grandpa. by the way. Oh man. I've been waiting to be a grandpa since junior high. I've been telling everybody I met for the last 20 or 30 years that my big ambition is to be a grandpa. And there's, uh, there's certain things that uh, yeah, that you might have thought, maybe somebody listening, you have this ambition, man, don't keep that thing a secret. Write the memo, write the letter, make the call, take the drive. If you're getting the, the vibe, the people that accomplish these things, they took their ambition, they found they're kind of picky about what that ambition was. You know, like I, I'm so uh, uh, wired to change my mind all the time. So like on day one, if I said I wanted a horse, if on day two, if I got the horse on day three, I'd say, what horse? <laughs> so when you're, when it comes to ambitions, pick one that's really worthy of all the time you're going to spend pursuing it. When you got the phone call or the letter or whatever it was, it says you're our new leader of faith-based initiatives. Um, were you surprised or had you kind of landed that plane uh, through a, by setting it up over uh, months and months and years? Yeah, it felt more like a landing of plane. And I I also have the, um, I probably don't, some people would say victory laps. Others would say giving God the glory and praise for what just happened. Whatever it is, I don't spend enough time in that space. I just move on to like the next task, right? And so um, maybe there was a little bit of celebration, but it was more just kind of all right, now what do we have to do next? You know, what do we have to, we got to, we have an inauguration to put together and, and then we have an office to, to set up. I also had the um, interesting opportunity, some would say challenge, of being the youngest ever head of a White House office. So I was 25 and then 26 moving into this role. And I didn't <laughs> tell anyone awesome. my age, not even pres- President-elect Obama, like, because I didn't want anyone, they would ask me and I'd say, you, I'm not going to tell you. And if you look it up in my file, I'm going to sue you. Because, <laughs> so, because, so, but I did have this additional burden of being younger than like everyone else uh, um, around me. So, I mean, I had a lot of work to do it. So I, I kind of moved more into the workspace of you know, what's next, um, rather than spending a lot of time kind of reflecting on where I was. And I love know, that idea. I've seen, noticed that in you for years, like you keep your eyes on your own paper. You're not worried about what everybody else is doing. You're just saying like, I've got this beautiful thing in front of me. I'm going to do my best at that. You ended up writing a lot of devotions, uh, for the president. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that they dated back to the campaign. Um, and again, one, it was one of those things where I kind of just jumped out there. Um, I wasn't super close to then Senator Obama. Um, but, you know, he knew me, he hired me in this faith outreach role on, on the campaign. But I, I just I realized one morning, just kind of in my own quiet time that he had a lot of people giving him a lot of advice, but I wondered if he had anyone sending him scripture, <laughs> or if anyone, anyone that was um, helping him. Um, find a moment of peace, um, you know, when he starts his day. And so I asked a buddy of mine, Reggie Love, who was his body man, um, 
for um, his email address, his personal email, um, rather than his, his work. Um, and I, I also asked him if he thought this was a good idea to send him a devotional in the morning. And Reggie said, you know, I'll give you his email address, but I think it's a terrible idea. <laughs> I think you're going to get fired. <laughs> and so I had to kind of push through that. And um, I sent him a brief reflection one morning. It was just a poem by Wendell Berry and a reflection on the 23rd Psalm. And um, just kind of about restoring yourself, um, finding some quiet and still waters to restore yourself in, in, in busy times. Um, and I thought, you know, initially I, I, I thought he was going to respond like right away and he didn't. And five minutes later, 10 minutes later, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have got to tell my mom, I just got fired for emailing this guy. <laughs> but about 20 minutes after I sent it, um, Senator Obama wrote back and said, I don't know how you did this, Joshua, but um, this was exactly what I needed this morning. Would you mind sending these to me every day? And so I just started sending him devotionals um, in the morning, just kind of in my personal time. And that grew over the years. Um, and eventually when it was time for me to leave the White House, when I was ready to do something different, I asked him if he would mind if I put some of the best ones together, um, along with my own story, uh, into a book. And, and thankfully he said yes. Oh, what's the name of the book? called The President's Devotional, um, got it on our uh, daily table. readings that inspired President Obama and stories of faith in the White House. One of the things that uh, I've found true over years of knowing you, you don't wait for permission for things. You don't like to wait for all these green lights to line up. You know your ambition, and then you move towards it. You're humble enough to take a no if it comes your way, but I think a lot of people have uh, a, a hesitation because they just don't want it to not work. Yeah. And somehow you pushed through that. Like you just don't seem like you're afraid of it not working. Yeah. I mean, part of it, I, I think you have to st still navigate these things humbly. So I think it, you're right. I don't tend to wait for permission. But part of that is, I think I realized that most people aren't really thinking about, and this is not a negative thing, but most people aren't thinking about you enough to even think about giving you permission. Right. We, I think we overstate the, um, the extent to which like, you know, someone else is concerned with our lives. They're trying to figure themselves out, their relationship with God and their family and their work and so forth. They're not thinking about giving us a yes or a no. Most bosses are not sitting around, for example, thinking, I am not going to give Joshua or Bob a raise because of X, Y, Z. They just haven't thought about it. They literally just have not thought about it. And so it's on you or me to, to, to take the initiative to go in and ask for it because they're, they're not going to just naturally think about it on their own. And if God has placed it in your heart to go do this thing, then you can't think a, a book agent's going to be thinking about you or, you know, a venture capitalist is going to be thinking about you. You've got to put yourself on their agenda because you know that it's something that's for you. Yeah. You'd have to decide like a bad day wouldn't be having somebody say no, a bad day yeah. would be not trying. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. And a, and a bad day is, is when there's something in your gut that you just know you got to get out and you decide not to like, no, you got to just let it out. And Hey, the, you know, sometimes 99% of the time it's, it's great. And then that 1% of the time you learn something if it didn't work out. Yeah. Take us from uh, here. So uh, you left the administration. What, what was your next ambition after that? What have you been doing with yourself? So I had been kind of in the public sector, obviously, and worked in nonprofits, but I decided I wanted to start a business. I decided I wanted to, um, to prove to myself that I could succeed in the private sector. And so I started a consulting company. We produce and promote films and TV shows that have a social impact. And so we led big campaigns for films like Fences at, for Paramount and for Selma. Um, for Paramount as well. We work a lot with Oprah Winfrey and help to build big campaigns around her projects. Um, we, we also help clients solve tough challenges related to race in the world. And so tough stuff, but it's based on what I did for President Obama. So for example, we've been working for three years with Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, Jefferson's presidential home in Virginia. Um, Jefferson was an amazing man and founding father and president. He also owned people. And, and uh, uh, Monticello wanted our help to think about how do we tell this part of the story in a way that um, that is honest, that brings people in? Um, and so we helped them figure that out. And eventually they actually opened up some new exhibits about slavery at Monticello um, that you can take uh, when you go down there now. So I basically, uh, Bob, I started a consulting company. We do some really fun stuff. And my new adventure is um, ever since I was a teenager, um, I, I wanted 
you know, I'm uh, to I'm one of these internet geeks, and I wanted to start a tech company. I wanted to uh, to to make a widget um, th that was tech oriented that people would want to to to, to buy, and that would have an impact on the world. And so I've done that. I started a, a market research company called Gauge. I can tell you more about it if you want to, but it's um it's it's going really well, and that's that's kind of the next phase for us. The part that I like the most is this idea of tenacity, focus, and not taking no. And I just hope the people that are listening, just think about your ambition. What is it that you've had like bottled up? You always wanted to do it. You're just afraid of getting a no. And you just are afraid that you're just going to feel so much sadness about being rejected. But I love uh, hearing from people like you, Joshua, that just said, I can, I can handle a no. What I don't want to handle is a, an unfulfilled ambition. I want to give it a try, leave it on the field. Tell me, tell me about this uh, with the, the uh, work that you're doing in race relations, there'll be all kinds of thoughts. Like, uh, it feels like it's an area that a lot of people would shy away from because they'll be criticized by saying it wrong or delivering it wrong. Um, your work uh, with President Obama, you were there and we've talked at some of the most difficult times that you've had to navigate some really sad things for our country and help supply words and context for that. What, you seem not afraid to d dive into the difficult things. Where does that come from? I know your faith informs that, but, but you're just not afraid to try to find the words in really difficult, impossible circumstances. Well, thank you for that, Bob. You're, you're way too kind in, in describing that. You know, part part of it is, um, man, I, I I try to breathe really deeply before I say something, <laughs> and um, and honestly, and not to get too too um, spiritual here, but I consult the Holy Spirit, man, and and see what God wants me to say, and then I talk. I workshop everything with my wife, Michelle Dubois, and other smart people in my life. And I, um, I really like sometimes, even if it's a personal conversation with someone that, you know, maybe needs to hear a tough truth from me or whatever, I pray about it first and I may write it down. Like I, I prepare for, for emotional moments just to, in the same way that, um, you know, some prepare for more practical things. Um, and so, you know, it's a, a lot of intentionality around it. Um, and, and, and also just try to, extend a presumption of goodwill to, to whoever I'm talking to, um, assuming that they want the best out of the conversation and that they may not know how to best express it, um, but that they are, you know, a, a, a child of God just like me. And so I think when we go into some dialogue really charged up or we think of another person as the enemy or that they're on the other side, then that can lead to um, just not the most constructive conversation. But when we go in and we know that, hey, that's a person who's flesh and blood. They came from a mom and a dad and, you know, they're trying to figure this world out just the way I am. Um, that allows you to kind of put your sword down a little bit and just come to them as, as, as human beings, as people. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's the Christmas answer, Bob. But just try to operate with humility, try to be as prepared as possible um, and try to extend the presumption of goodwill to whoever it is I'm talking to. Yeah, they, one of the things that uh, comes to mind a lot of times as a lawyer is just assuming that I'm going to be misunderstood often. Yeah. And, and when you try to integrate your faith into difficult conversations and issues, just know you'll be misunderstood. I'm not aiming for it, but misunderstanding will find you. And to just be graceful when it happens. And if you said something and you, it wasn't your best statement to apologize, and if it if it actually was something that you believe, but you can see somebody else has a different angle on it, then to take that. Yet you seem to be resilient. What do you do when you get sad? Everybody sees me. They misunderstand me as the balloon guy. Everything's always great. Like everything, just like I mess up and fall in a bed of roses. Um, but I actually am a really uh, emotional guy. Like I am is not as uh, yippy skippy as everybody always thinks. I cry really easy. And like, there's stuff that makes me sad. Well, you know, you've been up to our place in Canada and burned to the ground. I mean, that was a bad day and it was really sad for a while. How do you deal with sadness in your life? Yeah. I got a few people that I can be really sad with, Bob, and that's really important. Um, you know, there, there's some folks in my life that like, I have to put on no, you know, I don't have to be Obama's faith guy. I don't have to be CEO of a company. I, I can just be 
Joshua and all of my vulnerability and all of my failures and all of my doubts and fears. And I can just kind of lay all that stuff out there. Um, it doesn't have to be a ton of, a ton of folks. Um, and I certainly have appreciated your friendship in this regard over the years, Bob, and, and others in my life that, you know, I, I, I just can just be myself. I create spaces like, you know, I can, I can have spaces like the space we had up at the lodge those years ago, but also spaces that I have around me now um, where I can just think about who I am. Every Sunday I get in a kayak after church um, at a little uh, park up the street from my house. And sometimes I don't even uh, paddle that hard. I just kick my feet up and look up at the sky and ask myself, where am I right now? What's happening with me? What's awesome. going great? Um, spending time to really be thankful about what's what's going well. And what are the places where, you know, I, I want I want to do a little work. Um, so those are the two things. I, 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 I create spaces to reflect and seek out those spaces. And I also have some people in my life that I can just completely be myself with. Yeah, two uh, things that spring to mind when you're saying that is to be like self-aware, just kind of situationally aware. The first conversation God had with Adam and Eve when it got really wonky was like, where are you? Yeah. Um, and I don't think he was confused about where they were. I think he wanted to know, like, where are you? One of the things that Sweet Marie and I do all these years, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but I wear a mood ring. <laughs> and so when I travel around, we never talk about where I am geographically. We talk about like where I am in my heart, like how am I feeling? And this has been so helpful to have for two bucks on eBay. You can have one too. And like that whole idea of, uh, she'll say, what color is your ring? And I'll say, well, it's actually kind of green. And she's like, well, what does that mean? We don't like look up a manual to figure out what well, green means. I was in front of a lot of people today and I don't feel like I did my best. I didn't feel like I was clear today. And so like you have Michelle to find not just smart people, but wise people uh, to surround yourself with. She is a wise woman as is sweet Maria Goff. And, and so for the people listening, find your ambition, let people know what your ambition, tell everybody Tell the mailman if you get pulled over for speeding, tell the policeman, like just tell everybody what your ambition is and then pursue that. Don't wait for permission. Just keep pursuing that, but surround yourself with some wise people and then know where you're at to say, I'm feeling really vulnerable right now. And if you could fight to your point, if you can find a couple people that could ask you what color is your ring today, you could say, well, I'm not wearing it, but if I was it'd be kind of uh, dark and a little bit of red in it. And say like, you want somebody to say, what does that mean for you? And what it means for you is uh, this. And then surrounded with that, you can go after these things. And I'm so proud of you. I'm just really glad to call you a friend. And we love you, Bob. It's such an honor to be walking this, this road of life with you and with sweet Maria. And I can't wait to get out there and hang out with you at some point. Soon. Yeah, we're going to end up at the same place soon, but please uh, pass home blessings to your beautiful family. And, yeah, I will. Uh, and thank you so much for leading with love. You're one of these guys that pops to mind. The reason I called up and you were gracious enough to take time from all you're doing. Is it your guy who's leading with love? You're one of my wise friends. And yeah. I just want your message to go a long, long way. So thank, well, thank you. you. We, we feel the same about you and the, the catalytic impact that you've had for so many of us, where when we think about you, we literally smile, not because of just, you know, who you are on the surface, but because of who you are down deep, man, those smiles are resonating around the world and you're creating a lot of joy in the world. So we really appreciate you. Bob. Oh, thanks. Love you, buddy. Love you, man. Hey, that was a great conversation. Isn't he a good guy? Yeah, so real, so accessible. I mean, yeah. there's a few things. I was taking a lot of notes as you guys were talking. One of the things that stuck out to me from what he was saying is that it seemed to go from one opportunity to the next, like almost like it was planned, but it wasn't. Isn't that the crazy thing? In retrospect, oftentimes it seems seamless that this happened, then this right. happened. In the time when the reality is yeah. that there's a lot of stuff, a lot of waiting that happens in between. And if you're listening and you feel like I'm in one of those in between times, man, welcome to the club. Yeah. But keep your eye on your ambition. Right. Keep going. Look for those moments that will yeah. shape you. And uh, no yeah. one better than Joshua to teach me about those things. So yeah, drive four hours twice to go yeah. and see if there's an opportunity because and you've got this big dream. Instead of saying like, well, God closed the door. He's like, yep. no, let's buy more gas. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't crazy. It worked.
Yeah, he was on it. <laughs> and so as you're listening, see, what's your big ambition? Don't take no for an answer, mm-hmm. right? But don't take yes for an answer either all the right. time. Just because a door is open doesn't mean you need to walk through it. Yeah. But keep your eye on the prize, fixing your eyes on this beautiful ambition of yours, thinking that that might have been something God uniquely picked you to release into the world. And then let's get after that. I was writing down a note to myself. What are the ambitions that I have that seem crazy or impossible? I don't want to wait for permission. That's what I hear from his story. Yeah. I've written to the Pope every year for as many years (laughs) as I can remember, asking if we could meet. (laughs) I always get a letter back like, nope. (laughs) In Latin. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But it just keeps confirming for me, I've got the right address. (laughs) So I'm excited for the next conversation next week. We have Jason Russell on the show. Oh, another good man. Boy, transparent, authentic. He's been through a bunch, and he's got a lot of beautiful things to say. Well, stick with us next week, and make sure you go to the website or the show notes and download what we've got for you.